Welcome back to the show, fellow conspiracy realists. We're diving into a bit of hidden history. We've been on sort of a George Washington kick, I think it's safe to say, by the time this comes out. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's weird. When we think of spies, we think of like James Bond, the world's worst spy, or we think of the Cold War. But it's weird that growing up, we don't learn much about the colonial spies. Yeah. And that was a major thing. I think we get into in the episode, just the fact that everybody's speaking English, was prob- it probably made it really uh, both easy to spy, but then also really difficult to know who was a spy. There's also something that's just kind of interesting about colonial spying or like the early days of spy craft, uh, especially when you're a buff for this kind of stuff like we are. Mm, and you've probably heard of uh, Benedict Arnold. Uh, one of history's only few bad bends. Uh, but have you heard of Agent 355? No? Well, then listen up. <laughs> From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our compatriot Noel is on the road, but will be returning at some point in the future. They call me Ben. We are joined with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccan. Thanks for saving the show, as always, Paul. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Matt, today we are taking a journey back in time. Yes, time traveling again. That's <laughs> one of my favorite things to do. That's true. That's true. And of course, there's the uh, great point that people make sometimes that we're all time travelers. We're just moving in the f- toward the future one second per I don't know, second, right? <laughs> yes, it's definitely at a, an even clip. <laughs> Well, you know what? This might be an episode. This might be for another episode, better suited to a different line of thinking. But time is, you know, it's, doc- all, it's all relative. Yeah, right. As Doctor Who said, uh, what was it? Timey wimey stuff. Are you a Doctor Who fan? Uh, no. I totally thought you were going to say Doctor Who because <laughs> oh, that's that's yeah. the first thing I did when someone told me about it as a kid. It's a it's a great show, mm-hmm. and I have seen several episodes. Mm-hmm. I'm not like a you know a who a Doctor Who head. I don't know what the Whovian a Whovian yeah a uh, who uh, who enthusiast. Yep. All right. Uh, write in. Let us know what Doctor Who fans mm-hmm. are called or uh, what they self describe as. Our time travel today takes us back to the beginning of the United States, back to a time when it was uh, the odds were looking pretty dicey for the colonists, the would-be Americans, right? Yeah, they decided to buck the whole system and mm-hmm. fight their controllers. Yeah, they went – It's a rage, bold, bold move. They went rage against the machine, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this, uh, this is a story that you and I stumbled on – A long, long time ago in a different episode, and it surprised – I don't know about you, Matt, but it surprised the heck out of me. Oh, yeah. The the fact that espionage dates back this far and was as um, complicated Mm -hmm. as were the story we're going to talk about today, Mm -hmm. that was astounding to me. Yeah. You hit it. You you hit on the word of the day or a word of the day, espionage, right? Espionage is a tale as old as time or, in the case of this country, at least as old as the state. Espionage actually predates the uh, – act- colonial espionage predates the existence of the United States. Uh, this sort of stuff occurred when the idea of what we now call the U.S. was nothing more than a weird uh, twinkle – in the eyes of various founding fathers and would-be rulers of a new nation. Most of us associate the concept of spies and spycraft with works of fiction, right? You know, like what what, what are some of your favorites? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, you have to go back to 007, I think, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the the original, at least for me. Which is weird because technically wouldn't he be the seventh one? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. But yeah, James Bond, right? Oh yeah, and and characters that you find in stories like Mission Impossible, I, I remember mm-hmm. were really cool. Some of the concepts mm-hmm. in there, and then if you go, there's there were some Netflix shows back in the day that were surrounding espionage around World War II that I found the most fascinating because of the the technology they were dealing with at the time mm-hmm. and the stakes of being so high as they were. I think that's why I found that to be the most fascinating. Although I can't tell you the name of the show. Stakes is an S-T-A-K-E-S, right? It wasn't just a spy show featuring like these amazing ribeyes and T-bones. Just stacks of them. Just stacks of them. And then also spying. I would watch that show. Yeah, I I know what you're – I kind of know what you're thinking about, if not the specific episode, the trope, because I really enjoyed the television show The Americans. Oh, yeah. Which – have you seen that? Yeah. So that that show gets lauded often for being a – I don't know about an entirely realistic depiction, but a pretty – good depiction of how deep cover sleeper agents would actually work. So we see spycraft and espionage in all sorts of works of fiction, but we also know that strange real-life accusations of spying pop up every so often in the news cycle, and usually when they pop up, they disappear pretty quickly. Yeah, like a diplomat will get in trouble, Mm -hmm. but it's just some unnamed diplomat and then it goes away. Right, right. Or uh, three hikers will get cr- will get caught crossing the border into Iran, three American hikers, and then they'll be arrested as spies. The DPRK accuses people of being spies fairly often. Does it ever make you wonder if there are spies caught internally within the United States, but we just never hear anything about it? Oh, sure. They yeah. just disappear, basically. Yeah. Like there's the case of Jonathan Pollard, an American who spied for Israel and was and was caught. Uh, I think he was sentenced to life in prison for violating the Espionage Act. Hmm. But later, oh, surprise, he didn't have to do that. Uh, I think it was after 30 years of incarceration, he was released on November 20th. 2015. So some spies have been exposed and then served their time or somehow not been killed and have been able to continue living their lives. So it is possible to get away with it. Your odds are not very good. They were especially not that great in the Revolutionary War because in the Revolutionary War on the colonial side, your odds in general weren't spectacular. No, not at all. So the Revolutionary War, we all kind of know what that is. Uh, They call it, I think, the War for American Independence in other countries. But down here, this is the Revolutionary War. We're very, very self-important about it. And I think we've earned the right to be. The seeds of democracy had already been planted in the colonies. People were already thinking about becoming an independent country well before 1776. Uh, The war went from 1776 to 1783, ended by the Treaty of Paris. And when we look back at this war and the nation created, it's incredibly important to remember that the government that was put into place, or I guess that existed on paper, was – See, like, a, was seen like a crazy thing. It seemed yeah. to be an insane notion. How could you? How could you rule without a king? How close did George Washington come to becoming the king? Right. Well, and a lot has been said that the the presidency itself, the way it was created, was specifically to prevent any one man from becoming king mm-hmm. because of you know the way the way the country was set up with uh, dividing powers up. And not Mm -hmm. calling the president certain things, Mm -hmm. not referring to them in that way. Um, It was it was an active move to move away from a monarchy. Right, right. Again, that's the that's the official narrative, and we have an old episode on the unofficial narratives that you can check out. But it's several years old now, right? Oh yeah, it's back in the day. So they wanted something different. They did not want to. Practice resource extraction for the benefit of the kingdom across the pond. They did not want to pay taxes. 
They were very much against that. And they knew that due to the huge stretch of the Atlantic Ocean, even the world's most powerful naval force wouldn't be able to uh, to win the war easily. The problem was that even before the war actually broke out, the U.S. forces knew their odds of success were dangerously, dangerously low. And the colonial leaders, even the really optimistic ones, knew that if they were able to win independence, they would be literally paying for it in blood. Yeah, and uh, there's an historian, David McCullough, who wrote a book called 1776, which we would recommend. Um, the Americans suffered terrible, just horrendous losses, roughly uh, 25,000 casualties in all, or roughly about 1% of the entire colonial population, which if, if you think about that in like equivalent terms to today, that would be as though if there was a modern war within the United States on American soil that cost 3 million United States citizens' lives. That's, that's an intense thought. And as McCullough says, those who had been with Washington and who knew what a close call it was at the beginning thought the outcome, the ultimate outcome of the Revolutionary War was a little short of a miracle, the kind of thing that makes you say, for instance, hey, I'm not exactly a spiritual person, but is this a coincidence or is this destiny? Because so much stuff had to go right. Modern historians have speculated that if the colonists hadn't caught a number of key breaks, the rebellion might have been crushed. American colonies would have remained under the rule of King George and the ringleaders would have been executed in horrific yeah. ways. The people probably would have been um, forced to pay a punitive tax. Uh -huh. It would have made the situation increasingly unsustainable. But – the war occurred and as you know in the uh, Hamilton musical that comes up whenever we do a revolutionary <laughs> war episode, uh, the – there was this huge perception that the US forces were outmanned and outgunned. I think it's outgunned, outmanned <laughs> and I don't remember the next part. There's actually a lyric in there, right? Mm -hmm. I don't – which song is that? Right oh, Hand Man. Right Hand Man? Yeah. Oh, man. I need to listen. It's been almost a year since I I've think it's right rocked hand the man. soundtrack. Yeah. We'll have to listen to it after this. Or, Paul, uh, do you want to just play it low under the entire episode? <laughs> no, no. Oh, wait. We we'll get sued. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I heart. <laughs> so it, it is true that the United Kingdom had certain advantages. Um, it's not so much the number of people they had. But it's the experience those people had and the organization or discipline that the British soldiers possessed. But in the end, it kind of was one of the things that led to their downfall. Mm, Not so. necessarily, but because of the use of guerrilla tactics. Oh, that's right. Yes. So that we've talked about before. Yeah, um, Napoleonic warfare versus guerrilla tactics. Yeah, that's a good point, Matt. At the height of the war on the U.S. side, around 80,000 members of the Continental Army or militia members were active in service. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, on the British side, there were only about 56,000 British soldiers, but they were joined by 30,000 German mercenaries known as Hessians. And in uh, Sleepy Hollow – the Johnny Depp version yeah. of it, that's Christopher Walken's character is a Hessian at the very beginning. Oh, wow. That's the Headless Horseman? Uh-huh. Wow. So That's it's, not a spoiler. Saying, it's at the beginning of the movie, right? You're saying it's an allegory of some sort? I don't know. Perhaps. <laughs> or perhaps Hessians were just seen as scary characters due to their – the role they played in this war. But – the would-be Americans, which I guess we have to call the colonists at this time, had some surprising advantages. Yeah. Uh, first, the the main one is that they're fighting in a place that they know. They know the terrain. They know uh, ad advantageous spots and and locations. Uh, they're home, they're on home turf, and they didn't have to mess with any kind of real logistical things with supply chains. Uh, especially ones that would cross a major ocean like mm -hmm. the Atlantic, the mm -hmm. way the British had to do and the Germans. Uh, but second, they could easily, in theory, replenish their ranks if soldiers died because they could just 
get some more people there. Now, those people wouldn't be trained necessarily or even ready for battle in any way, but you could put bodies on the front lines or whatever lines you required. Something to put in front of the cannons, yeah. right? Yes, it is. You're, you're absolutely right. That supply chain problem was huge. And supply yeah. chains are still a huge problem in modern warfare today. Yeah. Logistics of warfare is probably – I mean, the, the biggest guns are important, right. but if you don't have a good supply chain to not only feed people and get supplies and other things that you need to your, uh, the human beings that are there performing the work, uh, you're, you're screwed. Uh, yeah. And then on the colonist side at this time, there's a big question of finance. How, how on earth do we pay for this, right? Yeah. And we just talked about that in our live show. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Through the creation of the first central bank. <laughs> Thanks, Hamilton. What a creative name. Uh, so they, uh, they, there were people who said, should we abandon all hope? Is this a not only horrific endeavor but ultimately a fruitless one? It was clear that the war would be a close thing, possibly a losing conflict for the Americans with brutal consequences for anyone – not just for anyone active in the rebellion but anyone who wasn't – an active British loyalist. They would – they would – the population would bear the punishment, right? If this thing didn't succeed. But unbeknownst to most, the colonists still had a few tricks up their sleeves. Oh, yeah. One of the most important aspects of the colonial military was this extensive spy network that they had been building and were continuing to build. Uh, it was – it was this huge apparatus that in its own way became as important as the weapons, the cannons that the mm -hmm. that the colonists had to fire at somebody because they had people on the inside everywhere. In fact, this intelligence network was so stinking good that even today, mysteries about this time and this network remain unsolved. Ooh. You know what that sounds like? Time for a word from our sponsor? That's exactly what it sounds like. Here's where it gets crazy. So intelligence work is fundamentally American. The creation of this nation is uh, inseparable from the creation of this nation's intelligence network. Military and civilian leaders of the American Revolution didn't just use espionage, covert action, counterintelligence, deception, and cryptanalysis to offset the British Army's advantage. They used it very well. They were very, very good at it. And the techniques they employed were pretty sophisticated even by today's standards. Oh, yeah. And when the history books look back – at the the things that the Americans did, the the heroes of the revolution, a lot of times they'll look over names like Agent Seven Eleven. <laughs> I know, which is hilarious to me. <laughs> when they're talking about people like John Bolton or George Washington or perhaps uh, Patrick Henry, mm -hmm. um, but they should because as we're gonna as you're gonna learn here, as we learned, they were as important or integral to the effort as any of those uh, big names that we just mentioned. Right, right. Uh, Agent, Agent 7-Eleven, which is going to crack me up, and John Bolton, different John, not, not the John who's currently uh, serving in the U.S. now. Correct. He's not some ancient centuries old vampire. <laughs> it was John Bolton. Should be kind of cool. More vampires in office, that's what I say. Well, in the so these guys were part of something. Oh yes, sorry, I was I, I started daydreaming full on <laughs> Walter Mitty style about vampires in office. I, I I am pretty on board with it, but um, you're right, Matt. They were part of something that a lot of people were unaware of: a spy ring called the Culper Ring, and these people's identities were kept secret until well after the war ended. In 1778, a guy named Benjamin Talmadge, a young American officer who was George Washington's new chief of intelligence, organized this top-secret network of spies. Several of these people, it's important to note, were just otherwise ordinary citizens. No military experience, no 
political ambitions per se. Mm -hmm. Some of them, in fact, were probably just the idle rich. Oh, who, yeah. Who uh, had meetings with specific people. Right. Who on the surface were British loyalists, you know what I mean? And, and probably had British representatives at their house and they talked about how best to keep down the peasants and the filth. Absolutely. And, and they were so secretive about this that even Washington, the guy in charge of everybody, the entire military, the, the country that is being born, mm -hmm. he said, no, no, I don't even want to know who these people are. Do not tell me. Oh, yeah. It was a huge deal to him that he not know and that as few people know as possible because they didn't want there to be any way that the ring might be compromised. So for recruits, Talmadge turns to people that he already knows, people who he made friends with in his hometown on Long Island. Because how do you trust somebody enough to be a spy? Like building trust to get someone to be a spy – it's no, uh, it's no short order. There's, right. a, there's a lot of work you got to put into that. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And even today, there, the process to just work at the FBI or work at the CIA uh, involves exhaustive vetting. Also, we should point out that a lot of uh, a lot of those images of a quote CIA spy get romanticized in fiction. Oftentimes, a spy is going to be a resident of a country that, you know, they already live in this country and they just got turned one way or another into an asset. Yeah. And then they're just ears and eyes. But there are real, you know, there are real James Bonds out there. They're just far fewer than you might think. Yeah. Right. So this guy is looking to build some bonds, to build some real spies. And he chooses a guy named Abraham Woodhull to be his – his agent, sort of his man on the ground. Mm -hmm. But Woodhull, who was codenamed Samuel Culper Sr., uh, mm -hmm. soon fell afoul of British counterintelligence because he kept traveling to Manhattan. And they were like, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. What's he, your business? He's right? like, I just really love the park. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a thing. And they say, what park? <laughs> yeah, what park are you talking there, about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh... But he – so Woodhull has has some moves. He's got some moxie. What's he do? Well, he, he actually recruited a relative who happened to be living with his sister um, in their – in her Manhattan boarding house. This guy was a dry goods merchant. He was also a society reporter and his name was Robert Townsend. But his real name <laughs> was Samuel Culper Jr., his real spy name. His real spy name when he was walking around. So it was junior and senior at this point. So now they're a family. So now they're a family. So they need some technology and they want to disguise their activities. They mm -hmm. have a couple of different methods and techniques. One of the strangest is that they used a type of invisible ink that was developed here in the States and – could only be, you know, read under cer certain circumstances. They developed a cipher, so they would write in code. And they were quite good at this. They were quite accomplished. They were not perfect and we'll explore – we'll explore the bumps in the road they encounter. Yeah. But for today's episode, we have to focus on the most mysterious member of the Culper Ring. This agent was a person – Yes. Or persons mm -hmm. uh, known only by the code name Agent 355. So much better than 7-Eleven. It is. It is much better than 7-Eleven. And for comic book fans, if you've read Why the Last Man, you will see there's, there's an Agent 355 in the story and it comes from this real historical person. Yeah. So here's what, <laughs> here's what we know. About Agent 55 because you're like, whoa, yeah. Agent 55 is, is such a badass in Why the Last Man. I can't believe there was a person really like this. There may have been. We don't know. That's the thing. There's no real historical consensus about who this person was, what they really did, even, uh, even what happened to them. We just know that they were alive and an active spy. Things got attributed to them. Yeah, there we go. That's a more fair way to say it, Matt. This person is so sketchy that 200 years later, we have, over 200 years later, yeah. we have no idea who they are. And 
maybe we never will, but we do know the things that were attributed to them were stunning and spectacular acts of spycraft. Oh, yeah. So wh- how do we know they're even real? That's That's – Square one, right? We know that because there is one direct reference to Agent 355 in any of the Culper Ring letters or correspondences. It is a letter from Abraham Woodhull. Remember, that's Culper Sr. Mm-hmm. to George Washington when several spies have been exposed and arrested. And what did Woodhull describe her as, Matt? One who hath been ever serviceable to this correspondence. That's right. Her. Yeah. Not only was Agent 355 one of the most accomplished and mysterious of the Culper spies, but many experts today believe Agent 355 may have been a woman or even a group of women. And this is based on the fact that the Culper ring coding system, uh, this, this phrase or this number 355 actually meant within their cipher, it meant lady. And there's not much other proof than that. Yeah. Uh, she let's, – let's assume that Agent 355 is indeed a woman. She worked with the American patriots during the Revolutionary War. She would have been recruited by Woodhull uh, rather than Talmadge, mm-hmm. they're guessing, uh, because of the way her reports coincided with British visits to New York City. Aha. Uh-huh. So – the fact that they call 355 – the fact that 355 means lady doesn't just imply, you know, gender. It also implies social standing. Yeah. Right? It means she probably had some kind of – I don't know. I don't know what you would call this. Um, prominence? Yeah. Affluent maybe. Ah, there Socially you go. Socially connected. So she was likely living in New York City. We know at some point Agent 355 had contact with Major John Andre and – Benedict Arnold, oh. one of the only bad Bens. Well, there's Benito <laughs> Mussolini. Yeah. There's Benedict Arnold. There's Benjamin Bratt. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. How I'm dare you? He's awesome. <laughs> so, so, I, don't, I don't know anything about it. I, I don't either. I just like the alliteration. <laughs> God, I, you know what, Matt? What if this is how we find out he's a terrible person? I know because I'm like, man, I really like this dude. Like, oh. OK. Yeah, we, we will. We are we, unsure about Benjamin Brett. That is our official stance. <laughs> undecided. Undecided. We're hopeful. Hang on. I'll ask Paul. Paul, do you know anything about Benjamin Bratt? He's just shaking his head. OK. He looked up. He's like, what are they talking about? <laughs> so – Away from Benjamin Bratt, back to Benedict Arnold, Major John Andre. There's pretty solid speculation that 355 passed along the information that exposed Benedict Arnold as a traitor and led to the arrest of Major John Andre, who was captured with maps of West Point and a pass signed by Arnold in his possession. Oh, man. So Benjamin Talmadge's memoirs, reveal this struggle to prevent the news of the major's capture from reaching Benedict Arnold because as soon as Benedict hears that someone's been exposed, he's going to hightail it. Andre confessed and then he was hanged. So around this time, Abraham Woodhull's correspondence, that's Culper Sr., indicates that Robert Townsend and other Culper Ring members fled New York City. They went into hiding. Something went sour. Something went south. Something Mm -hmm. was rotten in Denmark. Somebody knew. Somebody knew too much. (laughs) Um, Well, yeah, but then then after about two weeks, they they saw that there was some kind of decline in whatever heat they were experiencing, Mm -hmm. uh, decline in tempos, (laughs) and they returned. Yeah, which they probably shouldn't have done Because that's when, you know, we said there's that one direct reference to 355. Yeah. That's when Woodhull had to inform Talmadge about – and Washington about the arrest of, quote, several of our dear friends, including one who hath ever been serviceable to this correspondence, which was as close as they would come to saying, okay, the jig is up. Exactly. Let's look at how that occurred and then see if we can make any guesses toward Agent 355's identity, which remains, again, unknown in the modern day. And we'll get right back to that after a word from our sponsor. So, 
Matt, what do we know about the roundup of these suspected American spies? Well, let's go back to Major John Andre. When uh, the proverbial trap closed on him, it triggered this whole other thing, a roundup of suspects who were living in British-occupied territory. And there was a pregnant female spy Mm -hmm. who was arrested and questioned, Mm -hmm. but she refused to reveal any information of her activities or even who the father of her child was. So it's a double mystery wrapped in a burrito mystery. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Floating in a nice enigma sauce. Yeah. Uh, So this spy was held aboard a prison ship called the HMS Jersey. The HMS Jersey was famous for being squalid and just a a terrible, terrible, terrible place, even in the realm of ship prisons. Yeah, one of the last places you want to end up. Right. And the life expectancy in these prison ships was – you're not, few, you're not staying there for years. Yeah, like several months. The good news is you won't be that miserable for that long because yeah, you'll die. Such good news. Infection, starvation, abuse, violence, terrible, terrible place. But she, remember she was pregnant, she actually gave birth there. Yeah. She, according to this story, gave birth to a boy, but she died aboard the ship. And then the reports from the culprit ring decay significantly, even after Robert Townsend goes back to spying, there's a lot of speculation concerning Robert Townsend and this expectant female spy because according to letters from the Townsend family and their relatives and their loved ones, he was never the same after this person passed away. He lived out his days depressed. He never got married. Uh, he drank like a thirsty fish. And this, coupled with you know the female spy's pregnancy and his activities leading up to and during the arrest, caused some experts to speculate that he was actually the father of this child and that this spy, if she were Agent 355, was his common-law wife. Yeah, and then there's a legend that when the the boy that was born ended up being named Robert Townsend Jr., but a lot of academics kind of poo-poo this idea or they debunk it. They feel like it's just it. sort of conveniently romantic, right? Yeah, it, may, it would make for a great book. Mm-hmm. We do know that once he had news of this roundup or this search for spies, people who are suspect – Townsend did attempt to steal a ton of money. Yeah. And hightail it, skedaddle, probably with this person, if the yeah. story is true. One wonder if it was just out of fear, mm-hmm. um, but who knows? It's weird because you can go on the official CIA website and you'll see arguments that imply they accept this claim. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what we do know about Agent 355. There is, however, a – tantalizing bit of extra information in terms of this this kid story. Oh, yeah. Uh, this this little boy who became a man, <laughs> uh, Robert Townsend Jr., um, he was a son of James Townsend and also a brother of Robert Sr. He, uh, he became a lawyer. He went into politics and oddly enough, maybe not that oddly because we know who his mother is, right? Um One of his pet projects as a lawyer was the Prison Ship Martyrs Memorial Fund, which eventually became the Prison Ship Martyrs Monument at Fort Green Park in New York. Coincidence? I mean, I think it just has more to do with who his mom was, right? Born on a prison ship? Well, we don't know that that was his mother. Oh. Oh. So, okay. Yeah. So there's a mystery afoot, man, a mystery that remains. And that leads us to what we don't know about Agent 355, which is literally anything else, yeah. any, any stuff other than the, the wild guesses that we've seen, the speculation from historians at one mention in one letter, one direct reference rather. Other than that, absolutely nothing concrete is known about her other than when the British leaders were in New York, information 
came to General Washington at an incredibly quick and prodigious rate. But when those British leaders left town, the information slowed down to a trickle. So, yeah, probably lived in New York, but who is Agent 355? There there are a couple of possibilities, and maybe we can start with just some rough demographic stuff and work our way up to specific names. What yeah. do you say? One possibility is that she was a well-bred lady. Ooh, what a weird term. It just yeah. – it means probably from a wealthy family uh, mm-hmm. from New York uh, mm-hmm. within the uh, upper crust of society. And she was probably – this family was probably a loyalist family to the British, to the British government. And uh, you just have to imagine one of the reasons this is a good possibility is because such a position would have given her access to visiting officials just by having a meeting, having a dinner or uh, having officers over for any reason or another, Mm. especially if they're living in a kind of lavishly Mm -hmm. in New York. Oh, a social function. Yeah. I'm going to have a social function up here in New York City. (laughs) This is not how people talk in New York City. I hope it is. Why, it would be such a delight and merriment were that the case. Wouldn't it be great if... If uh, the if early, everybody talked like well, foghorn, like no, horn. if the if the early colonists had like New York accents, like real like gritty New York <laughs> accents, like full on, tell the British to get out of here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Yeah, you know what? I would be into that. So there's that, but that's a that's a really good guesstimate, isn't yeah. it? Oh, absolutely. A demographic guess. There's the other possibility that maybe she was agent. 355, again, if we're assuming 355 is a woman, there's this other possibility that 355 was in one of these great houses of note. She was with a well-bred family, to borrow that terrible term. Having constant contact with Mm -hmm. these officers. But not as an equal, perhaps as a servant, a maid in a house where British soldiers uh, slept or were quartered. Or bivouacked. (laughs) Yes, yes, exactly. (laughs) And from these guesses, we can go to some specific names. You'll hear people such as Anna Strong proposed as Agent 355. She was a known member of the Culper spy ring and she was Abraham Woodhull's neighbor. Hmm. She she had a cool – these people all have her specialties, right? Yeah. Like her cool shtick was that she would convey messages via – the way she hung laundry on her clothesline. Oh, that is so cool. It makes you paranoid when you when you <laughs> learn about how people signal things. Just everything is a sign now or you a know, code. I honestly, when I see somebody bend over to tie their shoelaces. Oh, my gosh. I know. I know. Is That, that is way too paranoid of me. But I, I try not to stand around when they're doing that. I get that sometimes. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm profile. I'm basically profiling people who have laces in their shoes. Dude, I was driving by this dude the other day and he just happened to bend – like he like made, made eye contact with me as I'm driving past. Mm-hmm. Then he bent down to his backpack. And I, I did not like it one bit <laughs> because I was just like, uh, uh, what's happening? What, what exchange is occurring here? What's the signal? Yeah. <laughs> also, I, I don't know about you, but it always seemed like it would be so much fun to perpetrate those sorts of spy activities. Oh, just uh, randomly? Just like in a park. <laughs> with, <laughs> walk by and have walk by and switch suitcases with someone. Oh yes, or do that thing where they're you know back to back benches and you sit on one one side of the bench and the other person sits on the other side facing away from you. Oh, that's great! And then just remark about the passers by mm-hmm. to the other person mm-hmm. quietly. Oh man, it just se- it seems like it would be it would be fun because personally, if I saw somebody doing a suitcase handoff. I would be I would be mystified. It would make my day. These were not suitcase handoff times, though. These were messages and laundry and disappearing ink times. But there are other candidates for 355, correct? Oh, yeah. One would be Sarah Horton Townsend. This is Robert Townsend's cousin. And there's also Elizabeth Bruggen or Bruggen, who helped American prisoners on British prison ships. Be, uh, and it's just trying – these ideas are just looking at – Placement, location, sure. uh, like is this a possibility? I mean really all of these are just kind of um, 
not reaching out in the dark because we've got these tiny little pieces, right? These breadcrumbs. Well, yeah. they're, they're built on the assumption that 355 being lady meant either a female spy or mm-hmm. a specific female spy. And all you can extrapolate from that is, hey, who were the uh, female spies active with the Culper ring? Yeah. In the TV show Turn, Washington Spies. Oh, is that the show you were That's talking the show about? I was thinking about. <laughs> That's it. There we go. We got there. <laughs> In turn, Agent 355 is actually a former slave of Anna Strong, who okay. we mentioned earlier. And that's 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 it. That's all we got. At this point, the cover-up seems to have been successful. More than 200 years after the Revolutionary War, we have no way of discerning the true identity of Agent 355. Is it possible that someone out there knows? Uh, Mm. Is it possible that one of our fellow listeners has passed this family secret down the line for generations? Is there a reason why you would want to – continue to keep it secret? Mm -hmm. Is it possible that somewhere in a long neglected attic or dusty tome, future historians might discover a new clue to 355's identity? For now, it is difficult to say, but one thing is for sure. The identity of Agent 355 was and remains the stuff they don't want you to know. And, at least in this case, America's forefathers proved more than capable of keeping it that way. Wow. So we have to say they did a good job. I mean, I know we knock we knock the government a little bit occasionally here yeah. on this show. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh absolute by the way, I'm I'm so silly. Turn is a whole different thing that I was also watching. I keep watching all these <laughs> spycraft shows. Uh-huh. Turn is about this kind of stuff, uh back in the Revolutionary War, which is a great show in my opinion. But this other one was about World War Two and I still can't remember. Oh, that's right. it. I'm, sorry. World War II. I'm sorry. Yeah, wait, no, let's 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 figure this out. Let's let's guess some. Um X Company? Um no, I th- no. Hotter Coulter? <laughs> that's probably not it either. Uh Hogan's Heroes. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's what it was called. Hogan's, Hogan's Heroes. Heroes. It's great. That's a real <laughs> hard hitting <laughs> Hard-hitting, dark drama there. I honestly cannot remember what it is. Well, God, it was so good, too. It was a BBC show, I want to say, I believe. How about this? How about we ask our fellow conspiracy realists for some help? Let us know what some of your favorite spy shows are. Let us know how you think the uh, – if you want to practice some counterfactual history, let us know what you think would have happened to this continent had the United States not emerged independent from the Revolutionary War. And Ooh. yes, of course, if you think the U.S. is still under the control of the United Kingdom, uh, why and what, what is the evidence? We'd love to hear it. We also have that episode about whether the U.K. still controls the U.S., which is a surprisingly prominent belief. Yeah, it really is. And when will British royalty finally bring about the moon child? I mean, we've been waiting for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, just bring that moon child on. It's time. Yeah. Yeah. I am very pro moon child. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would totally bow down to the moon child. It's kind of like the the species has peaked, you know? I'm sorry. We're both talking about the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, from the Invisibles, right? Yes, Particularly, yes. yes. Okay, cool, cool. The half-human, half-outer god hybrid. Yes. Yeah, that comes through a mirror or something. Uh-huh. This sounds wild, but this is not even spoiling <laughs> the Invisibles. <laughs> not at all. It's chock full of that stuff. And we want to thank you so much for uh, diving into this history here with what could have been – well, I guess it's probably not the most successful spy in U.S. history because we know they existed and the most successful spies are – Ghosts. Uh, yeah, right? Um, they're just traveling salespeople or something like that. They're listening to this episode. If they are, well, thank you because you could have listened to so many other spy podcasts. Well, they have to listen to all of it. It's just kind of – it downloads – Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, still, we appreciate your time. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this episode and we want to hear from you. Those were not idle questions. You can answer these questions on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. You can talk to us on Facebook. We're big fans of our community page. Here's where it gets crazy. But – And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, 
You can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.